Uh, talk about some of the Taiwan's inside baseball and what's been happening with uh, their re-election. Their, their current president was challenged in the primaries by the then premier who had just stepped down. Uh, now, the way Taiwan's government works is the, the executive branch, it's, it's like the cabinet, the, the would-be secretaries, have like the super secretary called a premier which you'll see sometimes in reference to Taiwan and China and other countries that they have a president, they have a premier. The, the premier is not elected, he's appointed. And uh, the, 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 the main premier throughout most of Taiwan's current president's time, for most of the good that happened, was the premier from my city. Well, city is, the, is a mistranslation, it should be province or region. Now, I mean, because, you know, I don't know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of absolute, of, of laughable translation stuff that comes out of Taiwan's government, including the way that they, they, they choose English letters to represent their Chinese names. There's, there's a lot that's laughable. But anyhow, the, uh, the mayor mistranslated of the city mistranslated that I'm from was the premier. Now, the premier and then the ministers under him, uh, the the executive branch, it's called Xin Zheng Yan, they are where all laws originate. Uh, plus the president. I do believe the president can introduce a, a new law, a, a, a new p bill to become legislation, to become law. Also, the executive branch. Now, the premier is the head of that department. So, it's imagine if law was created by, you know, say the president didn't meet with the cabinet, someone else met with the cabinet. It's like a super secretary. And then the, 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 all the different secretaries in America's government, let's say, got together and you had the Secretary of Health and Human Services and Secretary of Defense. And then, uh, sec well, actually, actually the, the Ministry of Defense, I believe, is a different department. It actually serves under the president. But let's say you had the Secretary of State and then the Secretary of um, uh, the Interior and then the Secretary of Health and Human Services and Secretary of Energy and Secretary of Treasury. All those guys got together and they voted and if they approved something, then something was now on the table to become a law. And then if Congress just argued about it, and if they voted it down, then it didn't become a law. But Congress had to approve it. Congress could not introduce a law. Imagine that. That's how laughable Taiwan's legal system uh, works as far as creating laws. Um, not legal justice system, just legal system. So the, the leader of that, it's called, called the premier, was from my city, and he was the most popular mistranslated mayor of a mistranslated city in Taiwan. It's, I think like he got reelected with 70% popularity, more than any other mistranslated mayor did, and it's simply because he wasn't corrupt. He wouldn't take bribe money, and he actually really didn't know what he was doing. One good thing that he did while he was premier is he continued the policy, the smart, brilliant policy of the premier immediately before him, which was to say no Microsoft documents. Basically, you know, no Microsoft Word, no Microsoft, uh, I don't know what they're all called, PowerPoint, uh, you know, none of those guys. We're going to do all uh, stuff that, that could be opened by Google documents like ODS and ODT files. Uh, all stuff that could be open by LibreOffice, formerly OpenOffice, before Oracle bought it and messed that up. So, it, like, it, you could theoretically use Linux for your platform and properly, correctly open up all Taiwan's government documents without having to import them. So, it, it, their argument was that they were spending $1 billion in local currency, which is 30 to the dollar. So, um, see, one... Taiwan dollar is three U.S. cents, thirty million dollars U.S. every year in Microsoft software licenses, just to be able to open files when they're not getting anything for it. They could just use open documents, and then other people don't have to pay money to open up that stuff. And you know that was brilliant, but it wasn't his idea. It was the guy before him, and that was William Lai, the premier. Um, the last thing he did before stepping down, I mean, they got creamed at the midterms. It, because it because it, because of the old it's all the old same the usual suspects that I'm always complaining about uh, in in Taiwan's government you know there was this old opposition party that finally got power and then like the Republicans in America do once they get control of Congress they don't do anything 
It, it, it's like we had Republicans controlling the presidency and Congress at some, one point during the Bush years, and the Republicans didn't do anything. In fact, during, during the Bush years, they passed some of the most anti-Republican type laws ever. And so they were making some reforms. A lot of it was work stuff so that the boss isn't a mini emperor who can just turn his employees into slaves, which is what's going, I mean, that's typical uh, Chinese Han Confucian society, uh, imper imperial Chinese Han Confucian society, which is something I talked about in the podcast weekly on Monday. But like, you know, the current president and her, her, her old always failed opposition party finally enacted some of those laws to make it so that employees had to be treated like humans with normal rights like that. That was a step in the right direction. She also tried to make same sex marriage like the first thing ever to happen in Taiwan, which I don't want to get into right now. Maybe I will in a podcast sometime, but I, or like a, like a podcast weekly, uh, the, the Monday thing. But what happened was yeah, this premier, he really was an idiot because he didn't do anything else. I, I, we had dengue fever going around. He's out selling his book. Um, he said, I'm a doctor. He's a doctor. He was a doctor who would, who would go to his clinic on Mondays and work as a doctor on Mondays, even though he was mayor, which was great because it kept him in touch with the people. But dengue fever's breaking out. They had like 300, 400 people were, were sick and dying of the thing in the hospitals. The hospitals were overcrowded and he's out selling his book. And he says, I'm a doctor. Uh, I know that we can't do anything at all, so you don't listen to your worries. Uh, listen to me. I'm the doctor. Uh, there's nothing we can do. I'm going to go sell my book. Like, that was his answer. And, uh, like, they started to make it illegal to smoke in almost all of the buildings and outside the buildings, like, everywhere. Like, there's this attack on smokers, um, which is, like, in, in America, it's, like, smoking is restricted. In Taiwan, they kind of want to just attack you for it. And the last thing that idiot did, he's honest idiot. He's an ethical idiot. He's an idiot who loves Taiwan, but he's an idiot. And the last thing that idiot did was uh, outlaw e-cigarettes. And, and his thing was, well, I'm a doctor and uh, we're not sure if uh, e-cigarette vape is healthy or not. So we're declaring that nicotine substances are under the control uh, to be treated as a pharmaceutical and uh, we're not letting anyone use that pharmaceutical. Ha ha. So it's illegal. Um, and that's kind of pretty much long and short of what it was uh, when they outlawed vape. The guy was a real idiot. It's like, you want people to stop smoking? How many people use vape to, to stop smoking cigarettes? You want people to stop smoking, but then you want to stop this water-based way for them to do it? Uh, what the yo? So, uh, yeah, he resigned because they got creamed at the midterms because they were a, a, a fail always do nothing party. Their president came in as a mover and shaker, kind of a Trump type in a sense, not, not that she was an accomplished businessman, but that she wanted to actually get stuff done and wasn't afraid of what China and, and, and the other guys were going to say. But her party had been just getting elected, but unable to change any laws for years and years and decades and decades. And so she, she went in and they didn't get much done. And so they got creamed at the midterms. Uh, because their government is like a third political party, an elitist class that just controls everybody in Taiwan, as I've described many times, as I've described in the past week a few times. So that mayor, all right, I've been going through Taiwanese politics. That that mayor, that, that, that mistranslated mayor of the mistranslated city that I'm from, William Lai, uh, was the premier who, one of the best things he ever did was maintain a policy he didn't even invent, and that is to use open source software instead of Microsoft. Other than that, he's pretty much an idiot. And he was upset about Taiwan's president and he challenged her in the primaries a few months ago. It's, it's, it's absurd. It's, it's, it's crazy what was going on. Well, uh, he lost, uh, the, the way they do primaries is, is the party does a carefully scientifically engineered survey. Like the, the political party does their own research to decide who the candidate should be. And usually it's based on, on a scientific survey and whoever comes out on top of all the surveys without question, they want to find out who the contender, who the best contender is going to be. And that's, that's their candidate. Well, they ousted him. I mean, cause, cause he was an idiot. He's a lovely idiot. He's an honest idiot, but he's an idiot. So, uh, I, I, and I'll tell you one thing though. He sure did drain the swamp in my city. I mean, all, you know, corrupt companies, corrupt, evil, dishonest businesses, have to keep bribing politicians to keep their corrupt businesses afloat. If they can't bribe the politicians, then they can't stay afloat and they just whoosh, go out of business and they're gone. 
It, it, it's like taking, uh, you know, moldy, nasty stuff and just letting it dry out in the sun for 30 minutes and, and it, it's dead. You, you killed it. Sunlight is the best uh, antiseptic or uh, um, disinfectant, excuse me. So I, uh, yeah, so that guy had challenged Tsai Ing-wen and that was going on. Well, he's gone now and it's just the current president all by herself. The opposition, now the opposition party, the old establishment party from Chiang Kai-shek, the nationalists who'd run away from the commies uh, way back like in 1948, uh, they, they'd been booted. They, they'd controlled the presidency and the legislature for so long. They had a short time where they had a president, but not the legislature. Just in this last presidential election four years ago, did they finally win both the legislature and the presidency to be able to get laws uh, passed. And they, so the old party finally lost for the first time and they're trying to take it back. And their front runner candidate, they, 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 had, they had three main front runners. One of them was their moderate uh, get along old lovable old hat who, who was the speaker of the legislature, Wang Jinping. And he was the speaker of the legislature during the sunflower student protests in the occupation. And he wanted to get the students out. And he said, we'll promise we're not going to have any secret talks with China. We promise. And he kept his promise. Uh, and his own party hated him because he would not call the police to go in and beat and bloody the students. He said, no, we're, we don't beat and bloody students. Uh, we get the students out, but we don't beat and bloody them. Um, Jiang Yihua, the, uh, the, the premier at the time, not you know the, the, the then premier, the head of the executive branch where laws start, he had called in the police to beat and bloody the students to get them out of the executive branch back when the sunflower students were occupying things. Um, but I, I don't know. The sunflower student occupation was about much more than just Taiwan trying to set up secret talks and secret, a secret meeting channel with China, uh, where I like to add, where they could sell U.S. military tech without anybody knowing either. Uh, they, they, for them, they were worried about economics and China slowly taking over. Uh, as an American, I added, okay, well, what about my country's military stuff tech that you guys have been buying? And the Taiwanese didn't really think about that, but you know, they had other legitimate concerns, but we Americans had a reason to be concerned also. So, uh, they're, they're then, um, the, uh, the control, which is the fourth branch of government that takes care of impeaching, uh, it, that they had just totally shut down. Like the office was empty. Like they, they, they were closed. They'd got packed up and gone home. They weren't doing their jobs uh, to, to hold uh, the, the, uh, Taiwan's president, uh, then, then, then Mind Joe, in check, President Ma. And he was cozying up to China, trying to establish secret talks. And another thing had happened. Their premier had said, we, the executive branch, are going to make a new law. And you and the legislature, of course, they can't make a new law. They just have to vote it up or down. If you don't vote in favor of it, then we're going to make it a law anyway without you. Ha, ha, ha. Which actually is like martial law, kind of like, and there's no basis for that. So a lot of absolute control happened in the days that the Sunflower students were taking over their government. And the speaker from that day actually was ethical and humane toward those students. And he was trying to get the nomination from his Chiang Kai-shek nationalist party so that he would be able to run against Taiwan's current president because he would actually be able to get support from uh, people from her party because he was actually reasonable and not this fascist, let's let China come in and take over. Let's, let's let China uh, do what China wants to do to Hong Kong. Let's, let's invite China to do that to Taiwan. That's what Chiang Kai-shek's party has turned into. Um, the, the, the issue is Chiang Kai-shek's party never liked Taiwan. They always wanted to go back to China. Taiwan was a pit stop. They never managed their government well. The government was run by, you know, their, their friends and cronies just to have jobs. And they never cared about the people. They're just staying in the stupid little island until they can get back to the mainland. And if they had to get back to the mainland by letting the Chinese, the, 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 the Chai Coms, the, the Chinese communists come in and take over Taiwan, that's how they'll get back to the mainland. They just want to go back to the mainland and get out of this stupid little island. Well, that's what the Chiang Kai-shek uh, KMT Guomingdang, the Nationalist Party, wanted. Well, they're getting more and more radical like that in, in, in recent elections. And Wang Jinping, the speaker of, of the legislature, the speaker of the powerless legislature from the Sunflower Students days, he actually isn't a radical like that. 
So he tried to run, but he lost. And then another guy who tried to run was Terry Go. You know, the head of Foxconn? You know, the company from Taiwan put in a big factory in Wisconsin? Yeah, he tried to run for president. His Chinese name is Guo Timing, and he actually ran an ad. It was on all the, all the buses that said in English, good timing, you know, Guo Timing, you know, good timing. Ha 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 ha. He, he tried to get elected to buy the presidency. He said that he said that Ma Do, which is a Chinese goddess, told him to run for president. I was like, Lord, he's going to lose because God is not going to let his name be Ma. God's not going to let someone run in the name of Chinese God and win an election in the free world. Uh, so I knew that he was doomed as soon as he said that a Chinese goddess had told him to run. There's that, that, that's like a direct challenge. That's like saying that God can't sink the Titanic. I mean, are, are you inviting? Are, are, is that a challenge? So I think God was up to the challenge and, uh, he, uh, he lost, you know, a lot of people were big fans of Terry go, uh, the, the Foxconn president. I mean, it was all oh, Trump. The businessman won in America. Businessman's going to win in Taiwan. No, 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 no. Terry Go was in the pocket of China. He had like nine, somewhere nine or 12 factories in China. And he wanted to get along. And again, that KMT, Chiang Kai-shek, Kuomintang, that nationalist party, their idea is to just give China what they want, acquiesce, feed the dragon, make him bigger, because then he'll be nice. The, the dragon only wants to hurt you if you argue with him. But if you let him have everything he asks for every day, all the new stuff he wants to steal from you every day, if you just let him keep stealing from you, then he won't want to steal from you. But if you try to stop him from stealing from you, that's what makes him want to steal from you. So let him steal from you. Uh, it, it's like this psychological surrender trap. And, and that's what economically America was doing with all these, uh, as Trump calls them, poorly negotiated trade uh, agreements that we have with people. So it's just this massive surrender party. They're totally unaware that China's killing millions and millions of Uyghurs. And they're just, it's just, they want to sit there and rub their temples and tell them everything's, you know, tell them themselves, everything's going to be okay. And that's what that old opposition party's become. Well, Terry Go also lost the election because with what's happening with China killing all, you know, these millions of people in, in the, the, the far uh, Western part of China and, you know, not to mention Tibet, not to mention Tiananmen Square and, I, you know, everything China's doing in Hong Kong and the, the threats to Taiwan. The, the, the president that supports Taiwan remaining outside of China is really popular in Taiwan. And the party that wants to get in bed with the Chinese is not popular these days. So what, what basically happened this past week is that the old speaker of the house, the old speaker of the house, the old speaker of the legislature, who actually wasn't a, a nationalist radical from Chiang Kai-shek's party, from Chiang Kai-shek's party, more of a moderate, um, he uh, he lost because they, they don't want they don't want good guys, you know. So he he didn't stand a chance. Uh, Guo Timing, the the Foxconn president, he lost because he was he wasn't he wasn't a butt kicker. Trump's a butt kicker. Uh, you know, a butt kicker businessman can win. He was a, he was a wimpy, flaky, slut surrender to everyone businessman. So he wasn't going to win. So Guo Timing is gone. Terry Go is gone. And then who was it that won? This crazy populist mayor eccentric guy from Kaohsiung, the twin city right next door to me. Uh, mistranslated city right next door to me. Um, the, uh, the would be Chicago of Taiwan. Um, the, actually it's where I wanted to first go when I, when I came here, but, um, Tainan's where I en ended up and actually I'm, I'm, I'm better off for it. Life never goes how we want it to go. Um, in fact, said it goes exactly how it should. So here's the, 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 the lowdown with, with this Han guy. He's a populist. He says he's crazy radical things, but looking at his calendar, Every one in three days, he took off personally for himself. He'd work, you know, three months would go by and he'd taken a month of personal days off. He'd go out and smile for the camera. Look, I'm digging ditches. Look, I'm, I'm planting trees or whatever. Look, look, I'm cleaning out the sewers. And recently we had uh, a bunch of rain for like a week and a half and he'd gone into the sewers himself. And he'd clean the sewers. He said, those sewers are clean and there's never going to be any more flooding in our mistranslated city. And so, like, within a few days, 
it rained and the city flooded. There were a bunch of people trapped on the bus and the bus was flooding and they were flooded, trapped on the bus after he just said that the city wasn't going to flood. And where was he? He was out of town (laughs) having fun. And then later on that night, he went to a really nice dinner, (laughs) dinner, big dinner party. And the city was having emergency city council meeting or something like that to decide what to do about the flooding. And he wasn't there because he was at his really nice dinner, you know. So uh, that's kind of collapsing in on him. Um, His line, you know, line, it's a social messenger, social media type of thing. His line account tweeted out a link that turned out to be for a porn site. (laughs) And uh, so that's the challenger who's who's saying we don't want to surrender to china but then this after he'd gone to hong kong and secretly hobnobbed with the chinese government at their office in hong kong the guy who's part of the pro surrender to china political party but then why i mean rush limbaugh has always said it the only way democrats win national elections is to lie and say that they're not democrats it's so i in, 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 in any of the toss-up districts, Democrats only win by saying that they're not Democrats. Arguably, Republicans have to do kind of the same thing. Um, although Republican strategy is to talk like Republicans, but then vote like Democrats. Democrats' strategy is to talk like Republicans and vote like Democrats. If, if you want to get elected in America, you have to talk like, like a Republican and vote like a Democrat. Um, so, because the Democrats don't care if you vote for laws that hurt the most of the Democrat voters. They don't, they don't notice results. They're noticing it more and more. But... Uh, Yeah, so that political party is all in favor of being in bed with China. China's not a threat. Let the dragon come eat us. They only want to eat us because we tell them to not eat us, so we should let them eat us, you know. And he's part of that political party. He said that he wasn't, but he'd obviously met with people and taken steps uh, proving that he was part of that. And he's a populist. He's... He's relatively new, inexperienced, doing a lot of things with bad optics. Anything that he's done that's good is pure optics. And uh, that idiot is the only challenger to Taiwan's current president who is more than likely to get reelected. And as I said at the symphony this week, the election's over. Um, I, I, I hope that that wasn't... Uh, maybe you got to listen to this podcast a few times. Sorry if this was a little bit rambly going through the, the political inside baseball of Taiwanese politics. Um, it's a bit hit and miss. Uh, but that's, that's the long and short. That's the gist of, of what's been going on in Taiwanese politics. Uh, a couple other thoughts I'm just going to close with. This is, I'm running long here. Sorry. Um, Jimmy Lai was interviewed at Fox. So go to PacificDailyTimes.com. Look at last week. Uh, the top of... Um, I want to think it would be the top of Hong Kong, it, 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 near, the, near the top of the stack in, in Hong Kong. Uh, Jimmy Lai gets interviewed. Now, he owns the Apple Daily, and he's the guy that, that funded this, this, this fake election, this mock election thing to just get votes from Hong Kongers to decide whether they wanted uh, to be able to vote in their own elections or something like that. And... He funded these 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 polls, um, kind of pseudo election things, totally unofficial, and you know just to get public response, and that brought out a whole bunch of uh, protesters as a result, and got a lot of things going, and that led to the umbrella movement in 2014, which was just after the sunflower students in Taiwan. So in Hong Kong, their umbrella movement three months occupying the, the streets in in central, um, uh, that. Yeah, Jimmy Lai funded the surveys that kind of were the spark that that started the forest fire with that. And also, Apple Daily, Jimmy Lai, his drones had some of the best flyover video of those protests. Um, So there was a lot at the time about how, well, Jimmy Lai is just a media mogul who wants to make money. Well, he was recently interviewed by Fox. And, you know, it's, 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 uh, the headline doesn't say it. I, I would have been more excited if it had said Jimmy Lai interview, uh, but it's a fantastic interview. Um, I actually thought this guy was kind of a crazy nut because I read what the newspaper said about him, seeing him in the interview in person. I, I'm sorry, folks. I really, I feel like I've let you down. Um, I'd never seen or understood Jimmy Lai in person, probably because he hasn't done many English interviews. Um, I mean, I, when I was there in the legislature, when the students were occupying it, there, there it was the Apple Daily camera. 
everyone had their cameras pointed at the speaker's podium. And their one camera had, it said Apple Daily posted right on the front of it. There the Apple Daily was. Um, so it's, it's kind of a pseudo inquire or pseudo tabloids, uh, pseudo real genuine newspaper, uh, newspaper. Um, and that's Jimmy Lai. Well, he got interviewed by Fox. So this is a thing. Um, okay. That's just, that's just fascinating. Yeah. Go, go PacificDailyTimes.com this week. Um, go, it'd, it'd be uh, July 22nd. Uh, look in the Hong Kong stack near the top, the Jimmy Lai interview with Fox news. Um, it's, it's, it, it's got a Jimmy Lai comment. And then the title for Fox News is different, uh, but it's Fox News, Jimmy Lai comment near the top of the Hong Kong stack. Okay, um, just a couple other things. I watched a video this week showing the history of Taiwan's opposition with China. That there's always been this separate spin-off Chinese government dealio on the island of Formosa, which is the, the old traditional name for... Taiwan for the, the island, the big island. Um, now they call it Taiwan. They, the name of the island is Taiwan, but it had an older name, Formosa, kind of like, um, you know, cities get new and old names. So, uh, they, the, the old, the, the old, traditionally Formosa, uh, Taiwan, there's always been a presence of Chinese there. The mainland in the ancient Qin dynasty days, uh, in back, around that time, all depending on who was bribing and conquering who, bribing and or conquering who back in those days. Uh, the, the, the big guys on, uh, in, in, on the mainland were not able to get Formosa, Taiwan, away from the Dutch. And it's, so there were all these Chinese workers who'd gone to Formosa and it was a workers' rebellion that finally rose up against the Dutch and said, we're sick of you Dutch. You're not much. <laughs> See what he did there. And, and the, you know, I mean, it was, it was basic roads and bridges stuff. We're talking, uh, what? 400 years ago. Like the pilgrims are landing in America, you know? And so, uh, you know, the city I was in was the big, most happening city. And, uh, you know, airports weren't invented for, another 300 years, but the first airport is in my city and I, mine was a capital city and right down by the beach is this abandoned old road, which was the most happening road on the whole island back in the days of the Dutch. And that, I mean, we still got walls that are 400 years old that you can go up and find pieces of, uh, they're, they're kind of set up as like local monuments. So like back in the days of the Dutch and the, the Chinese citizens who were from the mainland, who had moved to Taiwan to work, driving the Aborigines up into the hills and driving the immigrants before them closer to the foothills. So you had all these, these Chinese mainlanders that were on Taiwan. They were sick of the Dutch not building roads and bridges, more or less. So they revolted and they took over Taiwan in the name of the mainland government. But by the time they won... The mainland government had collapsed and lost to another revolution that was happening on the mainland. So once again, the government on the mainland was separated from the government in on Formosa. <laughs> and, and so, I, you know, most recently um, in 1948, uh, you know, Chiang Kai-shek and his fascist uh, political nationalist party had had had, I don't know. You know, Truman's plane landed. All of a sudden, he decided he couldn't win the war he was about to win. And he just took all the money from the gold of China and all the rich people out of China. And they fled to Taiwan. And the communists took over the mainland. And there hadn't really been any Chinese government presence, whether you're talking communist or you're talking Chiang Kai-shek nationalist. Uh, Sun Yat-sen started the, the, the Nationalist Party. It was a great Christian-ish kind of sort of type of thing. Uh, but Chiang Kai-shek came along and turned into a bunch of fascists and cronies. But there hadn't been any Chinese government rule of law on Taiwan anyway. It was just kind of this remote, oh, that thing. You know, it's, it's like when there's nothing there, they don't care. And then once they need it, they can't get it. So Chiang Kai-shek took the whole freaking Chinese army and put, took it to Taiwan and that's the only way that government asserted power there. And then the communists on the mainland had the run of the mill and they took over everything on the mainland. And so Chiang Kai-shek, within 
Chi with China's entire army, former army, took over to occupied Taiwan, and then they just set up an interim government so that they could get ready to launch back and go back to the mainland, which they never got around to because uh, it wasn't going to happen. So that's been the government here, and it's been a disaster and hasn't cared about the people. Well, this makes it interesting. It's like the mainland of China has never been able to assert authority over Taiwan. Before 1948... Uh, I mean, the, the Japanese had only surrendered in, in, 19, in 1945, and the Japanese had controlled Taiwan since before Sun Yat-sen had started the Nationalist uh, Party government. So China took Taiwan away from, or no, Japan, excuse me, took Taiwan away from old China, from the old last emperor. And so by the time Dr. Sun... Sun, Dr. Sun Yat-sen started this, this new Christian nationalist party and then later Chiang Kai-shek came along and bastardized and made it a bunch of cronious capitalist party, nationalist party. Before any of that happened, they had never controlled Taiwan. Japan surrendered in 1945, lost the war. Oh, we're leaving. So who's in charge of Taiwan? Well, uh, maybe China, but the current party never surrendered it to Japan. So the current government never surrendered, never ever owned Taiwan. So when Chiang Kai-shek ran away, it's like, oh, that's right. We have Taiwan back. And then so he ran to Taiwan and the mainland has never asserted proper authority over Taiwan in thousands of years. Never. So China has this age old dream, this fantasy that's never happened of wanting to come in and take over Taiwan. And they don't get that historically it's never, ever happened. The only time that the mainland's government ever takes over Taiwan is if the mainland government is dying because someone's attacking on the mainland and a bunch of a revolution happens on the island or the whole freaking government of the mainland China comes over and sits on Taiwan and takes over it that way and loses the mainland. Anyhow, it's just, it's the ongoing fight between Israel and the Palestinians. And, you know, in, in the Bible, it was Israel and the Philistines. It, it's never finished. I, I mean, I... You'll, you know, uh, the, you know, Jerusalem will control the Gaza Strip and Golan Heights before the mainland ever takes over Taiwan. So I don't know. This is just going to be fascinating and interesting to see how this all plays out. But it looks like we've got the pro-America, pro-Taiwan independence, not the surrender crony crony party. We've got the pro-independence incumbent current president who's probably going to win a second term. And that's not going to fare well with China's uh, peaceful, hostile takeover attempts. And so we could be looking at, at military conflict right in my own backyard. And uh, I'm excited because it, 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 it'll be one of those time periods that people will write about. Anyhow, love you very much. Thank you for listening to this long and boring and wild haired podcast. Let me know if you absolutely hated it and I'll never do anything so long and crazy like this again. But uh, I'm also thinking that maybe you enjoyed it. So see you next week.